I think it's um, the time. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this um, small speeches on posters and University Village uh, session. This is a very special session because these are very s uh, short presentations, only four minutes, and we have timers, one over there and one here. And uh, you have to stop after four minutes, otherwise we can't manage. We have 30 presentations and we have our time slot. Uh, there is no time for questions after the presentations, but if you all mention your poster number, everybody can come to you and talk to you at your poster after that or at the university village stand. So mention where you are and you can interact in all the breaks afterwards. Uh, so we will go. Uh, we will um, use the numbers in the program. So um, I think we can start now. And our first presentation is Philip Corner from Durham University in the United uh, in UK. He will talk about integrated and translational nanomedicine, simple and safe by design. Okay, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I work with Professor Moeen Magimi, uh, Magimi in the um, pharmacy, uh, pharmacy division at Durham University in England, and my poster is the, in the University Village. Um, is it supposed to work? No. Oh, yes. Oh, it does? No. Great. Um, so I thought I'd start by explaining the overall approach that we use to um, nanopharmaceutical development. And that is to first identify um, a target by having an understanding of the pathophysiologically, pathophysiological processes and also the effect of other systems relating to the identified target. And this allows us to use a safe and a simple by design approach where, for example, we could design a therapy which targets a specific process and this would not necessarily eliminate all off-target effects, but certainly help to limit those. We also consider the pharmaceutical viability and manufacturing issues. So it's all good and well designing a complex nanoparticle for drug delivery, but if it contains any components which aren't pharmaceutically acceptable or are going to not be within regulatory limits, or if the manufacturing process is too complicated to be scaled up efficiently, then it's never going to be feasible commercially. Uh, we also consider the impact um, in terms of improving quality of life for patients and also reducing costs compared to uh, traditional technologies. And um, again, if the improvements in these aren't significant, then it's not something that's going to be successful. So this figure shows how we both look at a molecular bio... Oh, sorry. So uh, a molecular bioscience approach, uh, which is by using any of the techniques shown in blue on the left-hand side here. So, for example, um, solid-state pharmaceutics, formulation characterization, or investigating drug character interactions. And that's to ensure that the therapy is safe from a, a dosage form point of view, that the correct dose can be repeatedly produced, and that, um, say, drug release is uh, act, um, sufficient to give an acceptable viability and so on. But we also... Look, um, use the systems approach using the uh, techniques in the right-hand side in blue, such as 3D cultures, animal model validation, or um, investigating single cell performance. And that's to ensure that not only are we uh, getting therapeutically relevant results, but also that the therapy is safe from a, um, not causing side effects or off-target um, effects. Or if these do occur, that we can understand why and to what extent. And that allows us to... Um, balance the therapeutic performance to the safety of the therapy. Um, and also by taking into consideration uh, throughout the process, the pharmaceutical acceptability and feasibility would allow us to progress any promising ther um, therapy therapies through to manufacturing. So that's a, an overall um, brief description of the, the process we use for <coughs> sorry, um, development and uh, how it relates to implementation of nanopharmaceutics. Um, and this last slide 
just uh, lists a number of the projects that um, are part of this approach and are being used by, um, in the group. And um, I won't go through them all because I don't have much time left, but one example would be um, investigating the adverse reactions to nanopharmaceuticals after administration by injection. And I've finished with plenty of time to spare, so thank you. That was very great. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Jonas Schnittert from the University of Twente, the Netherlands, and he will have two presentations. The first one is the, from the University Village, so it's the University of Twente, the activities in nanomedicine. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. So as Ruth mentioned, I'm a PhD student at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And I would like to take the chance and introduce you to some of the activities that we do in the field of nanomedicine in our institute. It's called the Mira Institute for Biomedical Technology and Technical Medicine. I am working in the... No, it's also not... No, it's working. Okay. I'm working in the uh, team of Dr. Jay Prakash, who has a research uh, line in nanomedicine focused especially on fibrosis and uh, tumor stroma. And within his team... We are identifying novel targets and uh, designing ligands to target uh, those. And uh, to identify the targets, we normally use uh, tissue microarrays and design novel peptides as uh, targeting ligands. We are also involved in the discovery of novel microRNA candidates and uh, identification of novel inhibitors. Uh, Professor Dr. Storm, who has a professorship at Utrecht University, also has a part-time position in our group, and he's contributing to the design of nanoparticle systems in which we try to implement uh, the targeting peptides, for example, which I mentioned uh, before. Uh, the systems which we use are lambosomal formulations, polymeric nanoparticles, and peptide-based nanocomplexes. Another uh, big uh, line of research done at the university is the development of in vitro 3D systems, and we also do preclinical testing. So Severin Legac and other researchers, they are specialized in the development of organ-on-a-chip models. And in collaboration uh, with our team, uh, we have developed uh, tumor stroma-rich 3D spheroid assays and uh, tumors on a chip. And there's also a device in development which is called the blood-brain barrier and the uh, chip for nanoparticle testing. And then we, as I mentioned, do the preclinical testing as well. Uh, specialized on fibrosis and uh, uh, fibrosis-driven cancer. And uh, therefore, we have tumor stroma-rich and metastatic animal models and acute chronic models for liver fibrosis as well as kidney fibrosis. And then there is also a lot of work done in the field of imaging. So Professor uh, Steinbergen, he is using photoacoustic imaging for the detection of breast cancer. Uh, then there is uh, Professor Michel Verschleus working on uh, microbubbles and droplets in ultrasound, first and foremost to increase the resolution of this technique, but also to support uh, local administration uh, of, uh, um, of nanomedicines. And uh, Professor Benny Tenaken, he, is, uh, he has a magnetic detection device called the DIFMAC, which is capable of sensing sentinel lymph nodes in breast cancer which is uh, currently under clinical testing. And we also have the capabilities to do optical and magnet resonance imaging within the institute. So if you're interested in any of the research I presented, uh, please approach me or Dr. Jay Prakash, who is also attending the conference. Uh, we are present in the university village. And then I also have my research poster, which I present later, which is number 65. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, everybody's keeping time at the moment. The timer wasn't uh, on this time, but I had my timer on. So <laughs> if, if um, the timer over there is not on, then just glimpse to my timer. You can see it also, it's visual. So you have a timer at any place. Our next presentation is Robert Gertzma from the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment in the Netherlands. 
And he will give you a review of available data on physical chemical properties, pharmacokinetics, toxicity, and side effects for nanomedicinal products on the European market. Yes, thank you very much, Ruth, for, uh, for say, saying out loud the entire title. That saves me, again, some time that I can use on the uh, next slides. Um, what I want to tell you about is a project that uh, was commissioned by six national government organizations that are related to medicines in some way in the Netherlands. So these are, are the policy department, the, the inspectorate for health, but also the medicines evaluation board that is uh, responsible for the admission uh, to the market of, uh, of medicines, um, and a few other organizations. What we did was uh, we had basically three parts. The first part was to make a horizon scan of existing and future uh, nanomedicines. The second one is to look at the benefits and the risk and to try and identify trends and knowledge gaps. And the third one uh, is to, to fill one of the knowledge gaps. So what did we do? The first uh, part has been finalized. Uh, the paper was finished uh, and published in uh, 2015. The second part is desk research, which is uh, ongoing. Um, we now have two papers uh, in preparation which are close to being submitted. One is on uh, an overview of physical chemical properties and pharmacokinetics, and the other one is a survey on specific toxicity and side effects. What we did was we looked uh, in the publicly available data, but then we also had a memorandum of understanding with our medicines evaluation board, where we were uh, allowed to look into the registration files, uh, e extract some anonymized data, and um, combine that with the publicly available data. So th these should be available. Uh, some of it are already on my poster, number 85, uh, and some of it is still work in progress. The third part is a PhD project on the interaction of uh, nanomedicines with the immune system. We had a poster on that last year, and the paper uh, that was uh, related to the work which uh, was already presented on the poster was um, actually published three days ago in the International Journal of Nanomedicine. So, some of the results. Um, for the physical chemical properties, uh, we looked uh, at a number of critical parameters. Uh, you, you can see them uh, on the slide. Uh, and we checked uh, in publicly available data and in registration files, and the only uh, parameters that we could really find back was, were size and size distribution, and this was only in 50% of the uh, available dossiers. For pharmacokinetics, we made a distinction between uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients that were inside a carrier, like a liposome, and uh, that were formulated as a nanoparticle itself, like for example, iron oxide. Uh, and for the NAPIs, like we call them, it was not clear whether the PK was determined for the NAPI as a particle, or a disintegrated particle, or maybe a dissolved fraction of the uh, API, or both. And uh, for the other category, only the PK of the total amount of API was currently investigated, and it was mostly unknown whether it was released API in a nanocarrier or a combination, and the PK of the carrier is completely absent. For the toxicological endpoints, um, we didn't identify any specific endpoint that, that was really uh, triggered most by nano-specific properties, but we do see data gaps for carcinogenicity and immunotoxicity, and especially immunotoxicological properties need further attention. Uh, this is a table. You can look at it on the poster in 85. Um, we are uh, working progress means that we look in the registration files and we try to get the columns no info available and not reported to, so to be sorted out and we can add them to the other columns. For immunotoxicity, we believe that virtually all particles eventually reach the immune system and there is a clear need for a specific testing battery to assess the function of the immune system. We've also looked at uh, endotoxin uh, levels, which is especially important in relation to immunotox testing. So uh, this you should look at the poster. Uh, the conclusion is that the regulatory science framework for assessment of risk-benefit ratio of nanomedicinal products needs further development. Questions can be asked at the poster or in any break. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, our next speaker is Edward Gatin from the University of Bucharest and uh, from also from the Palnagi Semmelweis University in Bucharest. And he will talk about the introduction of Raman technique to periodentistry. Hello. I'm from uh, yeah, this one, yes. 
I am from uh, University of Bucharest, and I was introduced before. Um, my interest is on uh, Raman technique. I enjoy very much this kind of investigation using Raman, and uh, especially to periodentistry, because uh, dentistry and special periodontal disease is a uh, very uh, unpleasant disease affecting many people and uh, what is uh, very bad doesn't matter the age starting I saw cases patients 20 years old till people very old 70 80 but here there are some other problems aging problems especially for women so uh, Regarding those methods for investigation and bone evaluation for our days is a big request for a very useful tool or method for a very good investigation regarding qualitative and quantitative investigation regarding the calcified tissues. Uh, so to make a correct evaluation of the bone uh, when you are doing the preparing surgery before the periodontal intervention, surgical intervention, and uh, then to prepare the bone for bone augmentation, you must need uh, correct, very precise, the quality of the bone before and after. So in this case, the usual methods are not offering you a very good precise. They are not precise enough because they are using x-rays, all of them. So x-rays offer you errors because there are not only hard tissue, there are soft tissues as well. So uh, to make a good uh, uh, evaluation, you need this kind of method and uh, my project is uh, in order to be a very independent method and only one to be done at the beginning of the treatment, the first surgery, and now and then for the second surgery. Uh, as I'm working, as you see, with uh, Semmelweis University of Budapest, they are on surgery. I am prepared for the second evaluation, I mean, after six, seven months to evaluate the quality of the bone for a lot of patients, consisting of eight patients. So I don't have many results here. Some of the results are to my poster number 84, because a full evaluation of the method, it will be primary in October, when I'll be back in Budapest to make the evaluation. Uh, but uh, is a very powerful method, this uh, uh, Raman spectroscopy, because as we know, is uh, used uh, with a great success in forensic investigations. So important is to evaluate the trend of calcium phosphates, because we need bioactive materials toward especially octa-calcium phosphates, and uh, to see the evolution to hydroxyapatite, the most stable phase of the calcium phosphates. So this is the target, and when we consider that the bone uh, generation process is finished. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next speaker is Maria Russo from the Instituto Italiano di Tecnologica, um, Center for Advanced Biomaterials for Healthcare in Italy. And she will talk about the microfluidic platform to design cross-linked hyaluronic acid nanoparticles for enhanced MRI. Good afternoon. 
I am a PhD student at the uh, University of Naples and I have a fellowship at the uh, Institute Italiano di Tecnologia. Today I will show um, uh, my PhD work based on a microfluidic platform to design cross-linked hyaluronic acid nanoparticles for enhanced magnetic resonance imaging. MRI today represents the first line diagnostic imaging modality for different applications because of its non-invasive nature and uh, its ability to obtain three-dimensional tomographical information. Uh, however, this technique suffers from low detection sensitivity and so um, MRI contrast agents are often, uh, are often administrated uh, to uh, to enhance the image, uh, the image contracts, but they have poor sensitivity, a rapid renal clearance, and a uh, nephrotoxicity effect. Um, nowadays, many efforts have been made to develop uh, new, better contrast agents uh, with an higher relaxivity and lower toxicity um, based on nanostructure encapsulating uh, gadolinium contrast agents. However, the exploitation of the microfluidics um, is uh, still missing. Uh, in, in this perspective, my work uh, is based on the production of hyaluronic acid uh, nanoparticles by a controlled nanoprecipitation in a microfluidic flow focusing uh, systems. Uh, we have chosen hyaluronic acid because its biocompatibility and its ability to obtain um, its ability to obtain a, um, um, and um, <laughs> Okay, um, okay. Uh, hyaluronic acid and uh, contrast agents has, have been uh, dissolved in water and um, were injected into the middle channel of my microfluidic device and um, their precipitation uh, is induced by uh, the mixing uh, with an antisolvent microfluidics allows um, a controls and continuous production of the nanoparticles overcoming the, um, the limits of the, uh, the batch processes and uh, can enable to modify and to manipulate the nanoparticle size and the loading of the, uh, the contrast agents, the gadolinium based contrast agents by fine tuning the process parameters such as flow rate, polymer concentration. Um, the first experiments are conducted to select the optimal flow rate condition and uh, we um, to obtain a, a monodispersed nanoparticles collection under 100 nanometers. Uh, in vitro relaxivity results show an higher relaxation rate of about 12 times uh, larger than the commercial and uh, um, the free contrast agents uh, in water at different concentration. Preliminary results uh, in, in vivo results uh, show confirms a, 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 an improvement of the MRI uh, signal and and uh, um, confirms the stability of the nanoparticles and uh, the no, um, no leakage of the gadolinium DTPA. Uh, to sum up, we have uh, proposed a, a microfluidic approach to obtain intravascular injectable and uh, completely biocompatible nanoparticles, uh, hydrogel nanoparticles, and trapping gadolinium DTPA to impact on the relaxometric properties of the contrast agents, uh, and so increase the relaxivity, boosting uh, a signal, uh, boosting 12 times uh, the, um, the, the MRI signal, and so um, uh, uh, um, leading a, uh, a reduction of the, uh, the dosage administration, reduced the nephrotoxicity and cooled impact uh, uh, readily functionalized on the tissue specificity and so on the early uh, detection. Um, and so thank you for the attention. I'd like to thank the organizer committee to give me the, this opportunity. My poster number is uh, 75. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you don't have to stress just to say that uh, <laughs> you, uh, everybody's doing really well, so don't be nervous or stress. Our next presentation is from Donatella Vecchioni from the same institute in Italy, and she will uh, talk about core shell nanoparticles with integrated PET, MRI, and optical detection for targeted and tunable multimodal imaging. Okay. Um, I am uh, a PhD student at the University of Naples, uh, and uh, today I'd like to talk about uh, a core shell nanoparticle for uh, multimodal um, imaging applications. So first of all, uh, uh, multimodal imaging um, is a new type of techniques that, can, uh, no, that allows to uh, combine two or more diagnostic uh, techniques in order to overcome the limits of the single diagnostic techniques. 
Uh, in particular, today uh, I presented uh, an application for uh, integrated PET MRI, uh, so a uh, new innovative uh, diagnostic technique that can um, simultaneously uh, acquire both structural and uh, functional uh, information. Um, despite the progress uh, in instrumentation, nowadays no biocompatible, biodegradable and um, food and drug administrated um, um, approved probes are available. So our um, purpose is to... Um, our purpose is to create uh, a new probe, a core shell probe, in which is encapsulated in the, uh, a contrast medium uh, for um, magnetic resonance uh, that after um, uh, the purification um, can be in contact uh, with uh, a radio tracer for um, a positron emission tomography. The um, core shell nanoparticles are produced by a complex quasar vision method in which is used uh, the temperature in order to speed up the, the process. And uh, um, uh, a um, double cross-linking uh, is used in order to improve the stability of the nanovector um, and to overcome the interference that exists between uh, the gadolinium DTPA and this type of process in case of nanoproduction. Results show um, not only an increase of the um, uh, relaxivity pro properties of the magnetic resonance, uh, but also an absorption of about 64% of the used radio tracer, an FDG. Uh, the same nanoparticles can be uh, used uh, also for uh, optical images applications. In fact, they can be uh, encapsulated or um, um, conjugated with different types of dyes or peptides to reach the um, active uh, targeting. Um, other types of application can be also for um, uh, theranostics or um, drug delivery. Um, in, in the end, so we realized uh, a core shell uh, polymeric nanoparticles uh, in order to uh, reduce the administration dose to, uh, to use um, in case of um, uh, PET MRI applications uh, that can be used also for uh, optical imaging uh, uh, modalities that can be um, decorated with uh, different types of peptides. Um, and uh, um, in this case, we can also reduce the side effects of the common um, probes that are today um, in, uh, in use. This uh, project uh, is in uh, combination, in collaboration with the different partners, in particular with the Institute of Research and Nuclear Diagnostic, um, SDN. In the end, I want to thank uh, all my colleagues uh, and uh, my group. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Rinat Meir from the Bal Ilan University in Israel, and she will speak about nanomedicine for cancer immunotherapy, tracking cancer specific T cells in vivo with gold nanoparticles and CT imaging. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a PhD student in Bar Ilan at the Institute of Nanotechnology in the laboratory of Professor Rachel Tupolcher. Um, so using cancer killing T cells is one of the most promising immunotherapies. So the T cells are engineered to target and kill the cancer cells. But even though it's very promising, as we heard before, applying T cell therapy to the clinic could be very challenging. And one of the main reasons is that the fate of the injected cells is a real mystery. Once the cells are injected, there's not much known about their destination, their migration, and their biodistribution. So today, there is no ideal imaging technique for in vivo cell tracking, and there is a real need to develop a non-invasive technique to answer questions regarding the fate of the cells. In our lab, we developed a new technique for in vivo cell tracking. And the concept is based on two things, the combination of gold nanoparticles and CT imaging. So first, the cells are labeled with gold nanoparticles, and only then are they injected into the mouse and imaged with CT. These labeled cells were uh, IV injected into tumor-bearing mice, and then we were following them using CT scan. So 
So let's examine our results. So before, before injection of the cells, this is a small tumor and it cannot be observed by a CT scan. But then, 24 hours post-injection, we could see a signal at the tumor site. And this is due to the arrival of the labeled targeted T cells to the tumor. 48 hours post-injection, the signal even intensified. This is because even more cells arrive at the tumor and we could see a clear signal of the labeled targeted T cells at the tumor site. After this time point, the signal decreases, indicating that the T cells are starting to leave the tumor. So we have the kinetics and the homing of the T cells with the CT scan. In addition, uh, we could also scan the other parts of the body. Uh, for example, I'm showing here T cells in the lungs, in the spleen. We can see 2D images as well as three-dimensional images. So uh, the ability to inject cells and then see them in the body will help advance cell therapy to the clinic. CT is one of the most convenient imaging tools used in hospitals today. And if we'll be able to answer the questions, did the, did the cells reach their target, target, this would advance the cell therapy to the clinic. And imagine if in the future, after cell treatment, the patient could go into a CT scan and get results indicating that the cells actually arrive at their target. Thank you very much for listening. I think I will get a problem because everybody is so much in time or um, short of time that um, we, we go very fast. But I, I make a proposition. When we get to the one that is um, missing, we will take a five minute break. We don't need to go out of the room, but listening to 30 presentations in one row, uh, the, head go, uh, the head starts spinning. So I suggest, we are not there yet, so we, we will have um, three more presentations, then we take a short break, and then there is another one missing because of um, getting sick. So we will have two of those short breaks where you can just uh, interact with each other and s stretch your legs for five minutes. I hope this is okay for you. So our next presentation is Marion Paolini from Nanobiotics and the University Paris-Saclay in France. And she will talk about metabolism blocking nanoconstructs, a possible solution for drugs with narrow therapeutic windows. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So my name is Marion Paolini. My poster is 53. I'm working at uh, Nanobiotics under the supervision of the University Paris-Saclay. Uh, so my project uh, in my PhD is not a drug delivery system. It's not how to deliver the drug better. Uh, it's more how to prepare the body to receive the drug. So as you may know, uh, when a drug is injected uh, in the patient, most of the drug uh, in most cases will be eliminated right away. So there's a big part, a substan substantial part of the drug that is useless. Uh, why? Because um, in most of the cases, there is a first pass metabolism in the liver, meaning that the hepatocytes, and more precisely the CYP450 enzymes, will metabolize uh, the drug. Uh, so the drug is eliminated and useless, and it can even be uh, toxic because the metabolites created often are uh, more reactive species than the drug itself, and it can, um, it can be uh, dangerous for hepatocytes. So what we're, what we're doing is that we're injecting uh, nanoparticles made of uh, natural compounds prior to injecting the drug. And these nanoparticles are tar targeted to hepatocytes specifically. So they will reach hepatocytes, transiently block uh, CYP450 metabolism of the drug. So it's improving uh, the drug biodistribution and uh, improving the therapeutic outcome. We have uh, proven this concept in vitro and in vivo on uh, two human uh, uh, tumor models xenografted in mice. Uh, so these are the tumor growth delay curves uh, for one tumor model, that is uh, MDAMB. Um, 
So what we can conclude from these curves is that uh, for one dose of uh, docetaxel, so yes, so, sorry, I forgot to say that we are using docetaxel uh, chemotherapy drug as a model drug. Um, so for the same dose of docetaxel that is 10 milligram kilo, when we inject our nanoparticles prior to the drug, we have a better efficiency. So that's the docetaxel alone is the orange curve. And when we inject the nanoparticles prior to it, it's the gray curve. Um, and before uh, tumor regrowth, uh, we have the same efficacy with our, our nanoparticle and 10 milligram docetaxel, uh, the same efficacy than the maximum tolerated dose of docetaxel. But we don't have, uh, we have less toxicity um, at our dose with our nanoparticle. So we have proven uh, the concept with a uh, first nano object, uh, with a drug, as I said, uh, that, that is docetaxel. But now we're working on different nano objects with different targeting properties uh, to target different uh, CYP450 enzymes, for instance. And we're trying to show this, the concept with other uh, drugs than docetaxel. Uh, maybe in other therapeutic areas than cancer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Luciana Herda from the University um, C College of Dublin in Ireland, and she will talk about designing the BioNano interface for barrier targeting. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Luciana Herdam. I come from Dublin, where I work under the supervision of Professor Kenneth Dawson. And just before going to the science, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving us the chance to present here. So today I'm going to give you a very brief overview of our current strategy to investigate the BioNano interface for barrier targeting. Uh, we all know that so far, um, like in the, first, in the last few decades, have been a lot of developments in the arena of synthesis and um, characterization of nanomaterials, actually of targeted nanomaterials. However, very few have transitioned, successfully transitioned from the benchtop model to an actual in vivo um, targeted system. And we think that these failures might be due to um, ins insufficient data that we have at the moment on the nanoparticle or our nanomaterial surface. Um, it's quite clear and or it's become clear lately that the current characterization strategies that we have, the methodologies that we have, do not fail in giving us um, an insight into how subtle um, aspects of the nanomaterial surface play a key role in their functionality. And um, actually the, the aim of my work is to investigate um, how the surface of nanomaterials, of crafting nanomaterials, looks like and if they're accessible for biological recognition. So in order to do that, to have a look at the surface um, and see how good they are for uh, biology, I'm using a platform called epitope mapping. So we are using um, immunoprobes that recognize um, epitopes on the biomolecules on the surface of nanoparticles that are essential for receptor recognition so we can say or we can estimate if they're going to be successful or not, or functional or not. And at the moment, I'm using this um, as an early checkpoint um, for deciding if these nanomaterials that I'm making should go further or not, as uh, when nanomaterials progress from synthesis and grafting towards in vitro and in vivo, more time, effort, and quality are required. So we do need an early checkpoint uh, to make a decision. And working in a group uh, that focuses on understanding how engineer nanoscale interacts with living organisms, um, we are using this epitope mapping as a tool that is essential for us now to actually bridge the gap between synthesis and grafting and actual biological functionality. Um, and also has helped us recently to kind of rethink the strategies that we need for um, grafting of nanomaterials for targeting. And I say rethink is because um, I have recently used and optimized uh, the, immuno, the epitope mapping platform on a model of a particle that has been extensively um, uh, characterized and published by us in high impact journals. And we thought it was the um, 
pretty much um, state-of-the-art way of making particles by uh, controlling a size of particle, then ligands on the surface, grafting of proteins. However, uh, when we came to use the epitope mapping and investigated how many um, proteins on the surface of the particles are correctly oriented, hence um, functional for uh, interaction with uh, biological receptors, we found out that only 3% of whatever we put on the surface of nanoparticles is functional. And that was correlated with an in vitro response that showed that in complex media, our particles are not working for targeting in the way that we thought they would. And this only emphasizes how important there is to have um, a platform, a characterization platform that it doesn't just give uh, information on um, dispersion properties, but actually gives us uh, relevant information of how biologically functional our particles are and if it's even worth to bring them forward for anything or just drop them. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> Further information, poster 27. Thank you very much. The next speaker is oh. the next speaker is Maria Jose Morilla from the National University of Quilmes in Argentina, and she will talk about ultra small, highly negatively charged archaeolipid nanoparticles for active targeting to macrophages of the inflamed mucosa. Thank you very much for your presentation. So briefly, inflammatory bowel disease are chronic relapsing disorders of the gastrointestinal tract characterized by uh, chronic inflammation and endothelial injury, mainly caused by the uncontrolled activation of the mucosal immune system. Macrophages, it's, does it work? Oh, I think you have to point. Oh, oh, okay, don't worry. Macrophages plays a um, principal role uh, in maintaining inflammation because they produce a large amount of pro-inflammatory cytokines. The inflammatory mucosa is quite different from the normal mucosa. It is characterized by increased permeability, a thinner mucus layer, reduced pH, and accumulation of positive charge proteins. There is currently no cure for this disease. The treatment is symptomatic, and the frequent oral intake of anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressant drugs cause severely systemic side effects, and besides, uh, diminish the quality of life of patients. So, the aim of this project is to develop archaeolipid nanoparticles for targeting the anti-inflammatory dexamethasone to macrophages with minimal exposure of healthy tissue. So, what are archaeolipid nanoparticles? Are par nanoparticles made of a core of the triglyceridol compritol and, and a surface made of archaeolipids. Archaeolipids are lipids extracted from hyperallophilic archaebacteria. Archaeolipids are not phospholipids. They are quite similar, but, uh, but they behave quite different. Archaeolipids consist of polysoprenoid chains linked by an ether bone to the gla glycerol backbone, and there are two main reasons why we use archaeolipids in the surface of those nanoparticles. The first is because they are natural ligands of scavenger receptors class A that are mainly expressed on macrophages and dendritic cells, and the second is because of their structure, they are highly resistant to hydrolytic, oxidative, and enzymatic attack. So the hypothesis of this work is that these uh, archaeolipid nanoparticles could resist digestion, could avoid rapid elimination by diarrhea, and could enter the holes at the epithelium and be utterly taken up by macrophages. Briefly, these nanoparticles were prepared by the, by the simple and scalable method of homogenization of ultra ultrasonication. They resulted ultra small with a mean diameter of about 70 nanometers. It is important to note that most of the ordinary or conventional lipid nanoparticles made with conventional phospholipids have a mean diameter of about 200 or 300 nanometers. Low, low, they show very low uh, zeta potential. A platelet-shaped morphology, and they increase eight folds the dexamethasona solubility. Um, then, uh, archaeolipid nanoparticles were between two and, four and eight fold more uptaken by macrophages and epithelial intestinal cells than conventional nanoparticles. They show also good stability 
upon uh, incubation in simulated gastric and intestinal fluids, and they also sh uh, show to be uh, highly resistant to in vitro lipolysis in the presence of uh, pancreatic lipases. And finally, uh, they show a high anti-inflammatory activity. Free dexamethasone and dexamethasone loaded on conventional nanoparticles only could reduce the production of interleukin-6 on macrophages activated with lipopolysaccharide. Um, on the other hand, archaeolipin nanoparticles significantly reduce the production of all the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So finally, Sumarine archaeolipin nanoparticles are ultra small, highly negatively charged, stable under gastrointestinal conditions, safe and macrophage targeted, with no aid of chemical derivatization, and an efficient tool to reduce levels of pro inflammatory cytokines. Conclusion We think that archaeolipin nanoparticles may simplify the target therapies in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. In the future work, we will, take, we will test the activity in a, on three-dimensional models of intestinal epithelium simulating inflammation in order to reduce the use of animals in experimentations. So thank you very much for your attention. Our poster is number 28. I'm sorry, because I was some late. <laughs> thank no, you very much. No problem. Thank you very much. Now, um, if not, Azade Tahiri has suddenly show up, shown up. We take these five-minute breaks, as I said, just to clear our heads. And then we start, we start again exactly at 1440.